Barbara is an assistant professor of religion and church history and doctrine at Brigham Young University. She received a PhD in instructional psychology from Utah State University. Her research focuses on international church education with an emphasis in Mexico and instructional psychology with a focus in religious education. Previous to BYU, she worked as a teacher and researcher for the church educational system. She was born and raised in Salem, Oregon, served a Spanish-speaking mission in LA California Visitor Center and currently resides in Provo, Utah. Barbara especially enjoys spending time with her large family and friends, learning, teaching, traveling people in the great outdoors and life. Dr. Morgan. Thank you, Ron, and those who have presented already. It's an exciting topic for me to um, to just have the experience to be involved with these great people and recognize a little bit of their history. Um, the history of the church schools in Mexico is a history of, of culture and of policies and of politics and of globalization, but it also includes a great deal of obedience and faith and sacrifice and mixed, and mixed great change. One of the great women of education in the Mormon history is Annie Marie Woodbury Romney. I was always, as was already discussed by Scott, there was a great um, educational reserve in the colonies of Mexico. Anne Marie Rom Woodbury Romney was the first teacher. Um, she started education in her little hut in 1885. In her writings and her letter to her sister, she wrote, I am at my old business again teaching school. I have over 50 pupils with all sorts of books and not enough of any kind. Besides this, we have to furnish our own seats, and it is quite a sight to see us starting off to school every morning with our books under one arm and a chair or stool under the other. But we get along very well, considering that the children are very much better off than they would be running wild. As the colonists continued to grow in the Mexico area, there was a decision that was needed to be made to continue to build and expand, not, on, not only the educational system, but the buildings. So with the support of all of the saints in that area, with the great desire to educate the children and to strengthen the church, it was proposed that a larger building would be made. President Ivins, setting the tone for this meeting to create and get money for this building, said the following. It's the place for my dreams to materialize, his voice a bit, a bit emotional, and a chance to let you see the picture I've had in my mind ever since my first visit to the town. This master stroke was greeted not with profound silence, but with immediate bids for a chance to contribute. Bids that came so fast in such volume that Professor Wilson was forced to call a halt and, in a voice also touched with emotion, to beg them to take their turn and give the clerk a chance to make proper recordings. When the meeting closed two hours later, not a person in the room, there was not a person in the room, but had pledged donations for cash or labor or both. Every cent and hour of which came from willing hearts hearts that counted personal sacrifice, no sacrifice at all, when educational advantages for their children were concerned. With the exodus of 1912 and the, end of, and the end of the academies, the Church Board of Education had to make major changes. The church started shifting their emphasis to the extended building programs at Brigham Young University. They looked into building junior college of programs the church and large seminary and institute programs worldwide. And there were also major changes in the Mexican Department of Education and their policies. As the church in the colonies and the school in the colonies continued to grow as they returned from the, 18, from the 1912 exodus, they continued, as Scott pointed out, to continue a, a plan of isolationism. As they had people that came and visited, one of these people, Moises de la Pena, who was a respected Mex Mexican intellectual, made the following comment in the 1950s regarding the, the academy. The truth of the matter is that the religious prejudices make them look upon the official instruction with repugnancy and fear, and they are in fact absolutely free in their economic, academic program, a situation which ought to be corrected, since this illegal privilege cannot be tolerated at this time. On the other hand, they are zealous about obeying the laws regarding public registrations in births, marriages, and deaths. Their respect for Mexican law, with the exception of the schooling example mentioned, is inalterable and exemplary. As the church continued to grow in Mexico, it became more and more important for these citizens, these saints that were living in Mexi Mexican colonies, to abide by this Mexican law. Not only the abiding of the Mexican law became important, but 
we also had many members of the church who were who were becoming, who, who, sorry, members of the church from Mexican colonies that were going out and being influential throughout the rest of Mexico. As a result of this and great missionary work, many, many members of the church in Mexico, natives, natives in Mexico started joining the church. And it was already pointed out, we had great growth throughout the Mexican area. In 1944, there were approximately 5,000 members of the church, majority of them Mexican natives. By 1961, this, this growth, by 1960, the growth turned to 17,000. And by 1961, this went to around 20,000. So with this growth, growth of the saints in Mexico, also came a great need for the education of these native Mexican saints. However, at this time, there were no educational facilities outside of the Mexican colonies. So as a result, the native Mexicans started creating their own schools. In 1944, we have Bernabe Parra starting his first school. And with the birth of the boys, Bernabe Parra Monroy and Benjamin Parra Monroy, sons of Bernabe Parra Gutierrez and Emilia Monroe de Parra, who were born on December 4, 1936 and October 4, 1938, respectively, was also born the potential of a primary school sustained by members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the Pueblo of San Marcos Hidalgo. From the, from the diaries of Professor Luis Gutierrez, we have the following with this picture of these first groups of students that came to a school. During the first days of the month of March of 1944, some of the most noble, pure, and kind thoughts for humanity entered into the heart of man, referring to Barnabi Parra. On March 29th, I presented myself, he being the teacher, at 8.30 in the morning in the class of Mr. Parra to receive those that were my first followers in this small school. Noble and beautiful kids were those who, with a liking to studying, undertook the vigorous trail of a private school. After a few days of work, others began to hear that Mr. Parra had in his house a school that was said to give a complete education to the kids. For this, they had the desire to send their kids to where they were educated. And then he continues, like 12 little birds with their sweet chirping day after day brightened up, up all of the home. The days went past without feeling their beginning nor their end. All was a happy dream in which the days, weeks, and months of the year passed by fast. The children advanced in their studies. Again, as education continued to be important and as the church continued to grow in Mexico, among the natives especially, we see that more and more students of the native Mexicans wanted to enroll in school. By 1956, in this one school, created by this one person and assistance, there were over 171 children. The problem, however, was that although they had so many children, they didn't have a place to put the children. And so they were climbing and pleading and asking those living in Salt Lake and those leaders in Salt Lake, as well as their mission president, this time, President Bowman, to start creating other educational facilities so that these children could be educated. With the understanding of some of the issues that were going on with the, with, the, with the saints in the colonies, as well as the needed growth for education among the Native Americans, the first presidency, President J. Reuben Clark, um, Stephen L. Richards, and David O. McKay, asked for the following. For some times past, we have given consideration to the advisability of establishing a school in Mexico for the accommodation of our youth. Thus far, however, no definite decision has been reached as to where such a school should be located, what the character of the school would be, and who would be expected to attend it. We would be pleased to have you brethren serve as a committee with Brother Romney as a chairman to make a careful survey and study of the situation and submit to us your recommendations relative thereto. With this letter requesting the committee to go forward, Marion G. Romney with Joseph T. Bentley and Brother Bowman, who was actually killed in the middle of this process, started searching for and trying to do an evaluation of the church schools in Mexico. Their findings were the following, summarized. First, that the Mexican government was having difficulty providing educational facilities for its people. Second, that the Mexican government encouraged the development of private elementary schools. Third, that almost 50% of children between the ages of six and 14 throughout the country of Mexico were illiterate. Fourth, the children in a school are, adequately, are inadequately taken care of. Five, that the government held schools wherever it could find a facility, and that was anywhere they could find a place to go, the government <laughs> made a school. Six, 2,085 LDS kids, or Native Mexicans at that time, would be in the first to eighth grade during the 1959 to 1960 school year. Recommendations as a result of this study were first, that a large number of elementary schools be built in larger membership areas. Second, more specifically, that 12 to 15 elementary schools be in operation by the fall of 1960. Third, that a high school be built in Mexico City and, and included in those plans should be a junior college and a normal school. 
and fourth, that Daniel P. Taylor be appointed superintendent of the schools in Mexico, and A. Kenyon Wagner be appointed director of the Juarez schools. Just for the information on this, Daniel P. Taylor was at this time serving as the director of the schools in, in, the, in the colonies, and A. Kenyon Wagner was serving as the director of the primary schools. With this recommendation, Daniel P. Taylor did become the superintendent of all the schools over Mexico, and A. Kenyon Wagner took the place of Daniel Taylor over the schools in, in the colonies. Daniel P. Taylor moved immediately to Mexico City and started working on this program, trying to gather schools all over Mexico. However, because of Mexican laws, the church was unable to purchase those properties underneath the, ch the name of the church, so therefore they needed what was called the Sociedad Educativa y Cultural, which was basically an education, a society that was able to, to raise the need and help with the cultural situation of the members of the church. So in 1961, with the authorization from Elder Marion G. Romney and President Ernest L. Wilkinson, the Sociedad Educativa y Cultural has been formed for the titling of all school properties. With this growth of the, of the church in Mexico, and then of course with the understanding that they, would able, they were under and able to have a, a society, Mexico church schools grew immensely. As you can see from this simple slide, from 1887 to 1974, by the end of 1974 into 1975, there were in existence approximately 40 schools. I say approximately only in that some of the schools were closed and some of the schools were open. So altogether at this time, there were about 40 schools. With the growth of these schools and with this, this interest in education, it was also determined by leaders in Salt Lake and those living in, in Mexico especially that we needed a central school that would be of great impact and would be the cultural center of all the schools and the great hub. So as a result of that, they found was, found land, was <laughs> land was located and a school was built in Mexico City. The school, the idea of the school would be that not only would it be a secondary school that would be able to um, be the place where all these primary school students were able to go, but it would also be a preparatory school for the students graduating from, from secondary school. It would be a normal school which would allow teachers therefore to be able to go to different areas and teach all, all, of, the Native American all of the Native Mexican students throughout Mexico. And it was also to be a place where the students could come and live they would be living in dorms, they would be eating and cleaning, and they would also be working. It would give the students an opportunity to better understand the culture of the LDS church, the doctrines and principles, and have the opportunity to have showers, warm beds, families, and the opportunity to understand the religion and, and be able to grow in seminaries and institute programs. And then with the idea of them becoming leaders throughout the church as they return to their homes throughout Mexico. So in 1963, the land of Beni Merito was finally dedicated. And in, in trying to find this land and the place that it was in the school, it was said that the, the Beni Merito area should be functional, clean, but not excessive, in complete harmony with the Mexican culture. They should hire a local Mexican architect to give the building their Mexican touch and appear like a typical Mexican school. So this slide, as you see, is the area where Beni Merito de las Americas is. The part in the, mul the, part in the middle is now it's about a 100 acre partial piece of land. There are 40 dormitories in the middle, number of buildings, cafeteria, high school, uh, gymnasium type facility, seminary building, and many, many different classrooms. In the back of the picture, you can see that they have a big field, a football field, a baseball diamond, a track area, a large auditorium, and lots of area in the back to be playing and exercising in different areas. It also includes an extremely large library, one of the best facilities and educational facilities in all of Mexico known by many throughout the area. As this building, therefore, was, was dedicated, and this area was dedicated, this is what Marion G. Romney said in his prayer. This school that we are beginning today is destined to become a great cultural center, a Spanish language center. Its influence will reach beyond the Valley of Mexico. Hundreds of thousands of people will come here, and the nation will be edified in its education, in its culture, in its spirituality, and it will prepare men for a better future here on this earth and in the life to come. With the creation of this school, this is just simply a map showing the church's educational system throughout Mexico. Again, there are approximately 40 schools dotted throughout. As far as Beni Merito goes, most of the students that were going to Beni Merito were coming from all of these different primary schools and going there. So at the young age of 12, 13, 14, these students were leaving their families and they were going to boarding schools where they would stay with short visits to their families but be raised 
primarily by members of the church that were living and taking care of those boarding houses for these students. Imagine, if you can, uh, wards and stakes of 14 to 18 year old students. And BYU, it's often a big deal to have wards and stakes of young single adults, but in Mexico they had wards and stakes of youth, 14 to 18, teaching lessons and, and providing the education and providing the spiritual foundation and the leadership of bishops and stake presidents in those areas. As the schools continued to go forth in Mexico, in Mexico City especially, and in these primary schools, one of the biggest emphasis, emphases was the importance of incorporation and obeying the Mexican law. So Professor Manuel Lopez de Villa in a report from the Federal School Inspector said the following regarding these schools. All the Mormon schools are incorporated with and recognized with the public de department of education. In contrast with other incorporated schools, the Mormon rule and urban schools comply absolutely with the requisites as established and set forth by Article 3 of the Constitution and its corresponding appendages. The Mormon schools are clearly identified with the government of the Republic and the revolutionary ideals of social justice and liberal awareness. The educational labors of the Mormon community in Mexico must be considered as an effective assist in the development of education in our country. With this great growth of the educational program in Mexico, many, many people were being touched. Thousands of students were involved in these schools. It became the foundation not only for education for the members of the church, but also for leadership and for growth. However, as the church continued to expand, not only in Mexico, but throughout the world, it became of great importance to realize the foundational funding and, and the seminaries and institute expansion. And so as a result, with new leadership in the church educational system, especially in the direction of Elder Maxwell, a commissioner's report was, was decided upon and, and written. And so the main points of this new commissioner's report that was coming through in Salt Lake in 1971 had the following. First, that literacy and basic education are gospel needs. Second, that the church program will not duplicate otherwise available opportunities, especially in higher education. And third, ultimately all high school and college age Latter-day Saints should have access to weekday religious education in tandem with secular education. Following this commissioner's report, a study was taken place in Mexico, primarily in 1978 under the direction of Benjamin Martinez, where the study showed that although Mexican education was extremely important and the people loved their education, that it didn't necessarily follow and, and lie within the guidelines of the commissioner's report. Or in other words, it was found in this case that there were church programs that were duplicating otherwise available opportunities, especially in higher education, but also in primary education. As a result of this finding and, and continued uh, research, it was determined in, in the early 1980s that the church schools in Mexico, especially the primary schools, would be closed. From Dan um, Woodruff, we have this, this decision, his, his, his recollection of the decision to close the elementary schools, all, all 37 elementary schools in Mexico, including those in the colonies. Sorry, Dan Workman, this is his report. He says, the decision was made to close all but two of those schools, and the two were the, were the secondary schools and the preparatory schools being one. This was a terrible experience for me because I know how much those people love those schools. The announcement was first made to the teachers and then to the priest leaders and parents. These meetings were held simultaneously all over Mexico in all 40 of the schools that were going to be closed, all but two. They announced that the first presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve had met. They had been given the information about the schools and it was the will of the Lord that these schools would now be phased out and they would utilize the public schools. Then each congregation or group was asked to sustain the brethren in that decision and they were given the opportunity to object. There were only two or three in all 40 schools who raised hands in an objection, and none of them were members of the church, and they were all mothers. He continues, it was a great revelation to me about the loyalty of those Mex of people in Mexico, because none of them wanted to lose their schools, but if the prophet said they were closed, they were to be closed at whatever sacrifice. As a result of the closing of these schools, two schools were left in Mexico from the church. We have Beni Merito de las Americas in, in Mexico City, and then the academy. For the next 30 years, these schools continued to grow. They continued to expand. Mexico, Beni Merito having nearly 2,000 students in Academia Juarez, about approximately 2,000, I mean 200, 400, sorry. In January of 2013, the announcement came from the Brethren because of the decision to change, lower the age of missionaries from 19 to 18 for young men and 21 to 19 for young women, that we needed greater facilities for these, mission, for these missionaries. So with that decision being made, it was decided to close the Beni Merito and change it into an MTC. At the 
celebration for the 49th anniversary, this poster was hanging uh, for this celebration, reminding the students and all those who are coming to visit that the Lord will hasten his work at this time. And then they pled for those who are coming to this event and others events in the future to please help to preserve the spirit and enjoy the graduation of Benny Benito. So on, Jan on June of 26th of 2013, the MTC in Mexico City was open and, the, and the Benny Benito Las Americas was closed. Leaving, therefore, Academia Juarez is the last school in Mexico City. I mean, sorry, last school in Mexico. Again, as I started at the beginning, uh, the story of the schools in Mexico City is a story of great globalization of culture, of policies, and politics. But one of the things that I have learned as I watch these wonderful students and these faculty and everyone address and understand the issues regarding these policies that the church makes and the policies of Mexico, as these people in Mexico are people of, of faith, they're able to handle sacrifice. They recognize that sacrifice brings forth the blessings of heaven. They're able to change and they are obedient. And as a result of that, the church will continue to grow as Elder Nelson said. Finishing of an interview that I had with Elder Nelson regarding the saints in Mexico, he said to tell every mommy and every daddy, every state president, and every bishop that he loves the people of Mexico. And he challenged them that they would continue to be healthy so that they could actually see in the future what the Lord is planning on doing, not only with the people of Mexico, but with some of those sacred sites, specifically the sacred site of Beni Medito, and the church would continue to grow there as they continue to be, as they continue to be faithful. Thank you.